Chapter 6 Beyond Ethical Prior towers, usually inviting, appeared only quiet. The elevator lobby was empty, except for two men. The scientist and his benefactor stood shoulder to shoulder. James stood tall, maintaining his dominant stance while he waited. He stared straight ahead, preoccupied with his thoughts. The speed of Dr. Strostick's work caused him more than a degree of agitation. He had his reason for being impatient, and it weighed heavy on his mind. He involuntarily gave an audible sigh. His concentration broke off with the sound of the elevator's arrival. Mr. Pryor's awkward behavior had not gone unnoticed by Dr. Strostick. He decided the best course of action was to lighten the mood. He smiled to himself before blurting out the request. Floor 13, please. It was an apparent swipe at Mr. Pryor's Achilles heel and an ill-judged attempt at humor. He never could read a room, or an elevator for that matter. He was crystal clear by the look on Pryor's face that the joke had not landed. Dr. Strostick suddenly felt uneasy. Pryor took superstition very seriously, and the omission of floor 13 on elevators was a common practice on tall buildings, which he had insisted upon. He used his voice command to take control and requested the elevator go to Pryor Bio Labs on floor 59. The elevator began to ascend. Mr. Pryor's jaw tightened at the irritation the scientist was now causing him. It was meant to be a joke, Dr. Strostick responded. That was the last straw, and Pryor flew into a rage. He lunged towards the scientist, grabbing him by his lapels on his coat. He slammed him hard enough against the elevator wall, causing it to judder momentarily. Dr. Strostick, appalled, rapidly became outraged and attempted to defend himself. Stop! Ah! He squealed raising his arm in self-defense. He slumped to the floor of the elevator just as the doors opened. As Pryor turned his back to walk away from the situation, Dr. Strostick jumped up, now fueled by adrenaline, and grabbed hold of his taskmaster. Pryor was dragged to the floor, and both men tussled. Dr. Strostick was in great shape, and soon gained the upper hand in controlling the situation. Mr. Pryor had not anticipated the scientist's physical clout, and while exchanging blows, Dr. Strostick sunk a sickening punch to the side of his ribs. Mr. Pryor could taste the blood in his mouth as the breathing accelerated, and he began to cough uncontrollably. Dr. Strostick recognized the altercation was over and attempted to defuse the situation. Are you okay? He spoke with some concern, but Mr. Pryor did not reply. He just continued to cough and wiped the blood from his mouth onto his sleeve. The two men, now upright, looked at each other, still breathing heavily from the sudden exertion. Mr. Pryor's cough seemed to rescind, replaced by rapid breaths. Dr. Strostick tried to apologize and defend his current situation. I know you are frustrated, but I'm working alone now, and it takes time. Mr. Pryor responded with yet another violent coughing fit. Then, to get the scientist to understand the severe implications of his problem, he screamed at him, I don't have time. This was no longer about the fight. Dr. Strostick stared into his eyes. The two men, now exhausted, flopped heavily onto the floor facing each other. They spoke with sincerity, a real cards-on-the-table moment. Something they should have done long ago, before their relationship became dysfunctional and toxic. The truth was they needed each other now more than ever. Dr. Strostick disclosed that he was being blackmailed, and that the men he had sent, his heavies, Sully and T, to collect the invisibility suit from the orphanage, had just vanished. He'd been sent images of the van burnt out, and whoever it was had knowledge of the secret lab back at the orphanage. Pryor realized their past was catching up with them. The account Dr. Strostick gave was undoubtedly compelling. If the invisibility suit was gone, 
So was his beloved grandfather's pocket watch. Pryor felt a tightening in his lungs and clutched at his chest. He had one critical situation which could not be discussed. He was dying. Not from a blow from the scientist, but from something incurable. His luck was running out, and he knew it. He shrugged off an offer of assistance from Dr. Strostick and watched as the scientist walked away towards the lab. Dr. Strosig looked over his shoulder towards his boss. I got this. We'll be ready. I promise you. You damn well better be, Mr. Pryor muttered to himself. Mr. Dutaki, cloaked in the invisibility suit, had watched the remnants of the altercation between the two men, the voyeur within him enjoying not being seen. He had to desperately stop himself from slow clapping the pathetic spectacle before him. He realized all was not going to plan in prior towers and that the man blackmailing Dr. Strostick had to be his weasel employee, Percy, who was now flexing his knowledge for financial gain. The trouble with that was that Percy could also incriminate Mr. The Thraki, and if Percy were dealt with, he would have to clean that up himself. So Mr. The Thraki decided to pay Percy a visit, as Dr. Strostick, who was going nowhere, would keep for now. He would enjoy dealing with Dr. Strostick and discovering what had become of his parents, so that one was not going to be a quick death. Dr. Strostick was now in the lab alone with his prized crates. They were state-of-the-art silver Kevlar coated with electronic locks. Each had the necessary air grids for ventilation, suggesting to the uninitiated they had contained live cargo. He knew just how important this part of the work was, and anything less than a groundbreaking result would lead to failure. Dr. Strostick went to open the crates using his electronic key. The first opened with a satisfying release of air piston bolts. The crate opened and revealed its contents. The subject, a chimpanzee, was heavily sedated. The scientist lifted his subject and transferred him to his new home, a glass container much more extensive and way more humane than the cages used in less salubrious labs. Dr. Strostick was a scientist, but also respectful of his lab subjects, not through sentimentality, but through their importance to his success. Each monkey was transported to their respective containers. As Dr. Strostick furthered his thoughts, a monkey grabbed his sleeve. The scientist was startled, but not for long, as he realized he had potentially found his number one subject. Dr. Strostick had found that one lab monkey often rises above the rest in spirit and demeanor. If a monkey was to enter the time machine and return, and thus survive, it had to be strong in both spirit and physique. Any weakness would lead to potential failure. These subjects were already the best of hundreds, but only one could make the journey. Dr. Strostick could not take a chance on a group of monkeys being changed by the process of time travel and coming back to the present with mutant advantages. If this were the case, he would rather there was one subject only to marvel at, or possibly kill, depending on its changes. Clearly, this was the absolute cutting edge of science, and so it was a leap into the unknown where Dr. Strostick thrived. Ten monkeys were in the running for the top spot, and Dr. Strostick was ready to test them to their limit. They were all given code numbers, but he could not help but ascribe nicknames to them. The monkey who grabbed his sleeve was nicknamed Buzz. Only time would tell whether he would live up to his name. The scientist would spend the next few days locking himself in the lab, trying to condense months of work to produce the required outcome. He would need to assess each subject's ingenuity and intelligence. Some trials indicated the monkey IQ test approach devised in recent decades, but others involved new AI technology considering every type and nuance of ability. As with all of Strostick's work in the past, it wasn't the testing and the experimentation that was the key, but the interpretation of the results. The assessment evaluation was vital to progress, and he was damn good at it. After endless experimentation and evaluation, including physical activity and appraisal of each subject's health, two monkeys stood out 
They both had advanced intelligence coupled with a strong and healthy constitution. One was Buzz. Dr. Strostick's instincts were right. And the other was a monkey named Eagle. Eagle would stare directly at Dr. Strostick and look in his eyes, which was unnerving. Buzz was more powerful in many ways. But Eagle looked like he knew something more. He looked like he could just speak to Dr. Strostick. And sometimes when the tests were challenging, Eagle would look at the scientist and just sigh, then lower his brow and ace the test every time. The final few tests would now only be done with these two subjects, and it really was Buzz's power and determination against Eagle's ingenuity and wisdom. Dr. Strostick gave them both a final test. He wanted each subject to push a ball through a maze to reach the exit, then take it and put it in a bucket releasing a food reward. The ball was trapped in the maze and can only be moved by the subject's finger. Buzz went first and struggled with the maze, then found a shortcut that enabled his food reward within five minutes. Then it was Eagle's turn. He stood and just looked at the labyrinth, which confused Dr. Strostick. Had Eagle understood what he was to do? He waited and watched as Eagle clocked up 30 seconds without moving. Then, rather than start moving the ball, he went under the stands containing the maze structure and then screwed a bolt holding a trap door used for an earlier test. Eagle had remembered this test and learned from it. Instead, he simply moved the ball to the trap door, took it out, then walked to the bucket, put it in, and took the reward. As he ate his prize, he stared directly at Dr. Strostick while he chewed. It had taken Eagle less than one minute to complete. Dr. Strostick had found his number one winner. The scientist spoke. Congratulations, Eagle. You're going on a journey, my friend. Mr. Pryor had managed to avoid Dr. Strostick over the next few days. He thought it better to leave him to his work and instead focused on his health and sought restorative peace. He lay down gently upon his supersized bed. With one sweep of his arm, he displaced all the carefully positioned decorative pillows. Useless things, he muttered under his breath, aware of the rise and fall of his chest. He inhaled for a count of five and exhaled for a count of five, taking control of his breathing, something he had been advised to do. Mr. Pryor surveyed his opulent surroundings, focusing on a massive painting near the foot of his bed. It depicted an elderly couple staring at the ground. The two were dressed in ragged clothes. They were both openly palmed, poised perfectly to beg. In the background was a crop that had failed. The painting captured the hopelessness of the 14th century couple. To James Pryor, it served as a reminder of what happens when people have limited options and no backup plan. The artwork was bequeathed to him by his beloved grandfather. That and sixty billion dollars. His riches were tainted by one cruel twist of fate. His biological grandfather had also passed to him a rare genetic disease that would significantly shorten James Pryor's life. As a child, he had been traced through a database searching for male descendants of the family. Until his grandfather's intervention, James's childhood had been pretty miserable as his mother severely neglected the boy. They lived impoverished where little James needed everything, including the basics, such as shoes without holes and some clean clothes. His father died young, and he could now not conjure up an image of him. There were no happy or particularly sad memories, as his mind had just erased them. He remembers his joyless existence and the emptiness of being parented by a mother who was so drunk and incoherent most of the time being asleep for the rest. Little James, although resilient, suffered and was aware that this was not how it was for other children. Instead, he retreated into a made-up world and used his imagination like a suit of armor to protect him from reality. Then he recalls a day when a tall gentleman walked into his rotten little life, scooped him up in his strong, long arms, and James left all that he had known behind him. Stepping into a new world where money was no object, and through hard work, anything was possible. Thus he began life with his only mentor and beloved grandfather. 
The first gift he gave him was a pocket watch. James, he said, keep this and always remember how precious your time is upon this earth. Mr. Pryor was jolted back to reality and the loss he had felt for the watch that was now missing. The phone rang beside him and begged to be answered. It was Dr. Strostick. Initially, there was an awkward silence. Mr. Pryor, it's time, he said with clarity. At last, Mr. Pryor answered, I will meet you at the lab. Mr. Pryor walked into the lab with Dr. Strostick and both showed excitement. Mr. Pryor's excitement was tinged with desperation as he felt this was his chance to extend his life. Maybe his only chance. Dr. Strostick, however, was more interested in the personal success of a cutting-edge experiment leading to immortality in the scientific world. Also, he wanted to save his colleagues who had disappeared on that fateful day when the time machine had last been used for living subjects. He was sure they would see him as a hero for saving them. And Dr. Strostick's ego needed inflating after Mr. Pryor's constant psychological belittling. Initial planning for the time machine was understandably unusual. Mr. Pryor had promised the scientist great riches if he could succeed. He had imagined, as many have, that a time machine is a structure you step in, travel through time, then step out into the past or the future. In fact, Dr. Strostick and his colleagues' plan had shown that the energy required needed a large lab to hold the components. In effect, the time machine was the lab itself. Atomic lasers trained on a concrete floor from four sides. At the right frequency, concentration, and with enough power, a vortex appeared on the floor. At first it was small, a few centimeters, then with more intensity, the swirl of energy increased in size. Small objects were put in, and only once had both his colleagues got too close recklessly and been sucked in. Unfortunately, the power was so great that the whole power grid for the city went down for a week, and the vortex closed immediately, trapping the colleagues. Since then, Dr. Strostick has been trying to recreate the experiment to save them but he couldn't get the frequency and the power ratio to work. He had only been able to create a small, tiny whirlpool of energy. After many years of deliberation and endless experiments, he felt he could get a vortex to hold a small monkey. Dr. Strostig noticed that it appeared to act like a black hole. Was this the start of a new science? He believed it was, and even the thought drove him daily. The time had come for the prize subject, the monkey known as Eagle, to enter the time travel process. It was unclear whether there was a physical trauma related to entering the machine, so Dr. Strostick put Eagle in a protective suit and a helmet. However, that seemed inadequate for such an incredible and historical journey. The device was calibrated to have the monkey enter it, and then in five minutes, to return. However, the machine showed the monkey, seemingly gone for five minutes, would have been gone for most of his life, twenty years. Would the monkey return? Did the monkey have to be at the place of arrival in twenty years? Or was there a physical inevitability created by the time machine that, on the appointed time and date, the subject travels back? What state would the subject be in? And what effects would time travel have upon a living being? All of these answers were vital to the outcome of the project and its success. Dr. Strostick had the machine at the ready. He looked at Mr. Pryor and waited for the nod. After all, it was his project. Dr. Strostick was about to press the starting module when Mr. Pryor shouted, Stop! Wait! I nearly forgot. He went to a back room he used as an office and came out with a small but expensive-looking security case. It was a dull silver case with a carbon fiber imbued shell and a world-class time lock. Inside was a vial of Pryor's blood infected with his rare genetic disease and a full explanation inscribed on a tungsten tablet, enabling a virtually indestructible message. As a footnote, he promised untold wealth 
if the disease could be cured. The monkey needs to take this with him, Mr. Pryor bumbled excitedly. He's called Eagle, and anyway, what is it? Dr. Strostick answered irritably. Mr. Pryor stared at Dr. Strostick, which he took as a sign to ask no questions and start the machine. Dr. Strostick breathed, bit his lip in anticipation, and pressed the button. Both men stood back and watched with such trepidation, the importance of the hour being patently obvious. The sound of the power increasing with the machine and the lasers firing held Dr. Strostick's attention. Mr. Pryor was showing evidence of stress and appeared to have stopped breathing. Both men watched as a small vortex appeared, swirling and rushing. Eagle was strapped to a time-coded security chair due to release the animal after a split second of travel. The swirling whirlpool increased in size and was ready to receive the subject. Dr. Strostick pressed the delivery module and Eagle was propelled to the critical position. There was a low hum, an explosive bright light, and silence. Eagle had gone, and so had the vortex. Mr. Pryor and Dr. Strostick forgot their differences in roles and joyfully hugged each other with such relief. Mr. Pryor suddenly remembered who he was and moved away, but still had a triumphant smile on his face. What now, Strostick? he asked. We wait five minutes and hope he returns, Strostick replied philosophically. Both men sat and waited to look at a significant time counter on the wall. To Mr. Pryor, it ran slowly as he was desperate to see the monkey return. Dr. Strostick was way more concerned about the return, knowing there was no way of knowing what was coming back, if it was coming back at all. Finally, there were thirty seconds to go. Mr. Pryor sat with his left leg bouncing imperceptibly, indicating his nervous disposition. Dr. Strostick looked expectant and opened his drawer. He took out a revolver and loaded it, ready for any eventuality. Mr. Pryor nodded knowingly at Dr. Strostick as a few more seconds passed. As they both looked at the countdown, they whispered quietly, but together. Five, four, three, two, one. A low hum was heard and a ball of energy was spinning. Just then, a small gray-haired arm threw Mr. Pryor's case out of it, which slammed into the time clock on the wall with such ferocity it performed like a missile. Dr. Strostick stared as a strange-looking animal jumped into the middle of the lab floor. A bright light was seen, and then the swirling mass of energy disappeared, leaving the animal panting and growling. Dr. Strostick held on tightly to his revolver, but stopped short of pointing at the animal. He moved closer and looked at what Eagle had become. Could this be the young, vibrant chimp that traveled seemingly only five minutes ago? Eagle's hair was gray all over and full of bald patches. His skin was covered in brown spots, and his limbs were just skin and bone. He looked a complete mess, but he was significantly alive. God only knows what he has been through in the last twenty years. Mr. Pryor studied Eagle with both horror and a measure of unbounded curiosity. He couldn't stop looking at the monkey's left arm. It appeared much more powerful than before, and the monkey relied on it to move. A definite mutation had occurred, and the fingers seemed to have advanced motor skills. Without warning, Eagle bounded over to Dr. Strostick, panting with a mouth full of saliva. He jumped onto the desk and sat close to him. This was too close for Dr. Strostick as he pointed the gun directly at Eagle. He looked nervous as Eagle stared into his soul. The monkey with his mutant arm stretched out slowly but deliberately, taking a marker from Dr. Strostick's top pocket, who dared not move. Eagle held the pen and scribbled it on a piece of paper on the desk. Then, baring his teeth, Eagle slammed down the paper before him. It read, Twerp Bill awaits you. Eagle took his other hand and threw its contents towards Mr. Pryor, who caught it. Mr. Pryor looked down and gasped in astonishment. It was his grandfather's pocket watch, 
With that, the monkey faltered and collapsed onto the lab floor.